Hello and welcome to Onion Unlimited the podcast. I'm your host, Daniel Torridon, and I'm joined today by my guest, mental health expert, Francis Peters of uh, Free Choice Recovery, www.freechoice-recovery.com. It's a pleasure to uh, have you on the show, Francis. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Well, thank, thank you for uh, accepting my invitation. So ha- how are you today? Oh, fine, thank you. Yeah, it's early, oh, quite early in the morning, so uh, uh, early. starting where, the day. Where about, whereabouts are you based? I'm in uh, Australia. Close to Amsterdam, so I live in the Netherlands, in the middle ah, of the country. Okay. Fantastic. It's, it's yeah. lovely uh, to have you, and thank you so much for uh, making some time to uh, come on the show today. So very, very interested in what you have to say from your perspective as a mental health expert. We're going to be talking particularly today about uh, mandated shunning within religious communities. I know that's something quite close to your heart, as it is indeed mine. And we're going to be looking at the psychological effects that the practice of mandated shunning has on people. Very interested to hear your side of things from uh, a uh, mental health expert's perspective. I think you're going to have some very valuable insights. So uh, let's dive into it. Let's so, um, <laughs> let's start with your background, I guess, to start with. You're a mental health expert, mental health professional. Um, what was it that interested you in getting into mental health for a profession? Uh, why why do you do what you do, Francis? Well, it has it has a lot to do with my background because I was born and raised as a Jehovah's Witness and um, more of raised in a family where the father was not a Jehovah's Witness and my mother were, was. Okay. So she became a Jehovah's Witness when I was uh, still a baby. So I'm, I'm the fourth child of four. Uh, yeah, of, of, uh, and, and yeah, my mother was uh, was interested, uh, became uh, uh, got acquainted with Jehovah's Witnesses from door to door preaching, and um, so for me it was, I was born in, so I was uh, very familiar with with how the group worked. The other side of the story was that my father had a completely different. Um, opinion about things. Uh, mm-hmm. He had a completely different life, so it's it actually made it uh, even more attractive to stay on and being in that in in the group because there it it was it seemed to be safe. Yeah, according to uh, compared to a father who who was a bartender and had a very uh, yeah, he had a life just living like a, like a bachelor. Yep. Yeah, and and uh, often leaving his family, uh, just live their lives. So um, yeah. being a being a Jehovah's Witness, uh, you say it gave it gave you some kind of safety at the time. Um, I, I mean, there are there are benefits, I think, to uh, the community aspect of Jehovah's Witnesses. It wasn't all bad. I know I've done a, a podcast on that before it's not all bad is that is that your experience that it wasn't all bad it it so depends on what you know Mm. because if you are born and raised in it and you are sort of stuck in the magical thinking in the magical thinking of of the the whole story of paradise and and all the things that are bad in the world will 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 stop because God will intervene, the angels will intervene, and yep. and you'll be safe. That's a great story. Mm. It's it's a wonderful, <laughs> magical story. So, for for a child who who didn't feel safe, that sounds great. Yeah, and um, it 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 keeps you in that magical bubble because uh, all the people you are talking with or who you trust are people who think exactly the same. So yeah. you're in a sort of an echo chamber. <laughs> yes, very very much yeah. so. Yeah, I'm I'm quite quite familiar with the uh, the echo chamber myself. Um so you grew up as a um grew up as a Jehovah's Witness. Um you uh, you were baptized at the age of 15. Um I've read in your interview uh, that you had with Psychology magazine. And you were an active member for almost thirty years, so it sounds like you were quite uh, quite involved 
in it to start with. So what was it that kind of changed your mind? Well, I, I guess the question is what burst that bubble, that magical bubble that you, <laughs> yeah. that you speak of? Exactly, because we, we were the ones that uh, I, we married, my husband and I married early because, as you know, uh, no sex before marriage, so mm -hmm. a lot of young people marry early. Yep. <laughs> so, uh, but we knew each other from the time that we were, but I remember, uh, six years old. So I, I, I knew him very, very well. Yeah. And so we got married at, at 20. And um, so it, we kept each other also in that magical bubble. We were pioneering, or both of us were uh, uh, baptized at an early age. So we were very dedicated and completely believing the story and were completely into it in every mm -hmm. aspect. Uh, even uh, postponed uh, a family, uh, having a family because we needed to preach. Yeah? Um, so when we uh, got children later on, because I really mm. wanted to have a family, I really longed to have children. So um, I stopped pioneering. Um, my husband, uh, he kept on pioneering until, until our daughter was two years old because it became too much, uh, just having a job and also pioneering. And so we needed to do that. And so then the things started to change. You look different at the organization you are brought up in because mm. you start looking to it uh, from the eyes of a child. And um, so your perspective is completely changed. You need to get your feet on the ground and not stay in that magical bubble because you need to interact with people uh, of school, eh? on, on school, uh, yeah. other parents. Uh, my husband was uh, in contact with, uh, because of his work, he, he was an interpreter, an interpreter translator, because we, we preached in the Turkish field, so to speak, I preached in Turkish field for 25 years, so we could speak Turkish, and my husband was really good at it, so he became a judicial translator um, and interpreter, so he came in contact with a lot of people outside the group, and heard their stories, and just was completely... Uh, into the the world, the bad world, so to speak, from the perspective of Jehovah's Witnesses. Yep. And he was really astonished in how many similarities there were between people growing up as a Muslim and starting to criticize their own belief yep. and the way people responded. And not only that, but also the psychological effect of it he also uh, um, you know, was was listening to all of these people with their stories, and it affected him. Mm. And he started to think also more critically about uh, certain things that happened in the organization. And once you let in that um, knowing, okay, it might not all be true, or uh, you start to look more critical at the organization, then you the bubble starts to burst. Yeah. Uh, and especially so around the end of 1990s, um, it came out about the, the non-governmental organizations that also the, the organization had a part in that, that they had NGOs. Yeah, that the, um, that the Watchtower organization had actually had some connection with the United Nations. Yes. Mm. And that blew us... Yeah. blew us away in the, in a negative sense and uh, we thought how is that possible because people are getting this fellowship for having an amnesty international uh, membership mm. or something like that or mm. are not allowed to to be politically active in yeah. a classroom so what, what's this about huh? So I have no problem with NGOs, but if you talk badly about other religions having NGOs and then having them yourself, yeah. that's just yeah. Amazing. I mean, there was a uh, I, I I felt very similar. Uh, I could see a degree of hypocrisy with that one, uh, especially from the point of view as well. They ran a series of um, I think they were awake articles about how brilliant the United Nations is. 
I That's, remember. Do you remember yes. that? That was the yeah. Awake magazine, which is like a public facing magazine that the people at the UN would be reading. And then the, the more internal magazines uh, and books really, really criticize the United Nations as being a, a beast. Yeah. yeah, a bit where, where the false religion and false Christians Correct. are sitting and and yeah. lead uh, into oblivion. <laughs> yeah, so, so there's, there's like a degree yeah. of um, talking out, out of their mouths, and, and I know that didn't sit very comfort comfortably with me. It sounds like it didn't with you either. If we can just backtrack a little bit, you mentioned that uh, you had children, and that was yes. kind of the period of time that, that burst your uh, bubble. In uh, one of your interviews that I was reading online, it's a very good one with uh, Psychology Psychology Magazine, I think it was, you did an interview with them. You said uh, a lecture was given at the Jehovah's Witnesses, I, I presume that's at the Kingdom Hall, about dealing with fear and guilt. Um, as a child, I lived frugally and according to the strict rules of Jehovah's Witnesses. Uh, this is translated into English, so I'm not sure if it's a 100% correct translation. It says, there was always the pressure to live up to their ideal image, coupled with the fear that you were not good enough. Um, yeah. And we interacted as little as possible with people of other faiths and invested all of our time in the organisation. And then you said it was that particular talk or that reading that made you realise how often you acted out of duty, fear and guilt. Uh, yeah. Was that like a, was that something particularly with having the children that you felt you didn't want no. that fear and guilt to kind of be passed on to them? Oh, yes, absolutely. But mm. um, where it started was when our children got into more emotional problems, mm -hmm. like when they started to become uh, or get eight years old, seven years old, started to ask really good questions. Mm. Then, uh, because they were critical, yeah, they had questions, and I I found out that I couldn't answer them, or even became very anxious about not feeling that I could give a good answer. So that that really bothered me. But also seeing um, children being really upset and even close to being depressed about certain things, yeah thought well i have to i have to look up in the library books about self-confidence about uh, helping children to to become confident or to um so things like that mm. because if i talk to elders about it just praying and just hey, do all kinds of things and then it will change no it will not so i just wanted to know more about it from another angle yeah. And then when I just read all kinds of things about how important it is to keep, to help children become uh, self confident, and uh, and I thought that didn't happen with me. <laughs> so a lot of the things that I try to teach my children, I never experienced myself in that way. So I thought, where is that coming from? Mm. The lack confidence in myself or the, the fear that that sometimes really overwhelmed me as long as i was acting like a group identity and being the jehovah's witness doing all the things that was expected of me oh great yeah. i felt strong i felt oh i could do almost anything playing that part but yes. as soon as i fall back on my own identity yeah. I felt lost. I felt like a child who didn't know what to do. I was embarrassed about it. I thought, how can that be? So if somebody would, not a Jehovah's Witness, but sometimes you have to interact with people coming to your house, mending things. or do, And then I felt, as soon as I was interacting with people about nothing to do with the organization, I became a different person. And mm. I didn't like that. So it the that uneasy feeling in me and and sometimes really out yeah completely fear or panic mm. close to panic it bothered me because I thought yeah. where's that coming from so first I was blaming myself and I thought ah probably because something wrong with me yeah that's that that, that that's that sort of early stage in the waking up process isn't it where you start to sort of have the doubts and there's like a little uh, a little voice in the back of your head saying something's not quite right here 
Uh, I, yeah. I remember um, one of the first cracks for me. I was I was on a train um, coming back from London one one day, reading a book all about religion, and it just made a comment about how many different religions there are. I mean, tens of thousands of different religions, uh, denominations uh, of of the the main ones, and then smaller groups even with, within those. You know. Um, and I, I started thinking, what, what's the chance with all of those tens of thousand religions? I just so happened to be born into the only true one. That's, yeah. that's really lucky. That's, <laughs> yeah. you know, lucky. yeah. And it just sort of lodges there. And then similar to you, I sort of started to read a few things that showed there was a bit of hypocrisy there. Just from a psychological point of view, I, I don't know if you've, I'm, I'm sure you've latched on to this in the past. With the Watchtower publications, they say one thing, and then in another publication they say something completely different. I mean, give you an example. In one, they will say um, discouragement is the tool of the devil and you shouldn't get discouraged. Uh, don't feel guilty. Don't feel bad about yourself because that's what the devil wants you to feel. And then they'll also release another article a bit later that says you're not allowed to think anything about yourself and you're supposed to put yourself down and treat other people as, and so forth. Yeah. It's almost like um, psychologically, it's like they're just trying to keep you in a toing and froing. So you're never really sure where you are yeah. or what you actually think. Yeah. It, does that does that work from a from a it's, mental it's, health uh, expert's point of view? Is yeah. that something you've identified? Oh yeah, a lot because um, what these these kind of groups do is keep you out of balance. So you need to be right. out of balance, mm. and especially you need to. They do everything they can, and probably they won't. Most of them won't even be conscious about it because they've done it so many times, right. or they were born into that kind of a system. Yeah, but they um, they put enough pressure on you either from the side of emotional blackmail or the side of abuse of authority. Yeah. Just just being the one that tells you, well, this is this is true. And uh, you have to obey. Yeah. Um, but keeping them out of balance helps um, helps control people. So if you destabilize a person, you can keep on of, of keeping them in that state by keep on grooming, keep on uh, framing all the things that like discouragement is a very good example because define discouragement they define it in a way that suits them and that suits the uh, suits the group so discouragement is everything that might trigger your critical thinking in the group yeah. that's discouragement that's not discouragement in a normal uh, a normal book yep. that tells you exactly the meaning of it. So the the they reframe so many. So that's a loaded language. Also, what yep. you buzzwords. Uh, I heard you yep. talk about the the bite uh, analysis yep. of authoritarian control. Well, one of those is absolutely just just controlling that part of the information. The uh, feeding people with loaded language. You get a, a an own language in a group. Yeah. Uh, not only with Jehovah's Witnesses, with so many controlling groups do exactly the same. Yeah. They use loaded language to make, uh, well, this is how we all together understand this word. Mm. So well, that's a part of the mind control. As soon as you use yep. that word, it triggers all kinds of feelings and and things that, that either make you scared or... Yep. Uh, destabilize you yeah I guess. For, for anyone who uh, for anyone who who hasn't um already looked it up uh i i would also recommend very highly that you uh look up the bite model the b-i-t-e model by uh stephen hassan he's an expert on cults and the definition of cults and high control groups and when i went through the list of so b stands for behavior i is information t is thought and E is emotional. So you've got behavior control, information control, thought control, and emotion control. Um, 
when I went through the list of things that a high control group or a, a cult does to control your behavior, the information that you're allowed to be exposed to, even your own thoughts and emotions, I'd say it matched Jehovah's Witnesses at least 75%. Oh, yeah. At least. Now, I, I even made it score higher because mm. uh, when I was ju uh, starting to to read a book of Stephen Hassan uh, about um, the Bard model and, and about uh, definition of cults, how to do that, I was shocked in how many things I could apply to Jehovah's Witnesses. Yeah. And I was just completely out of balance for weeks, feeling so ashamed that I unknowingly was part of a of a cult. And yeah. I know nobody who is in a cult will realize or um, th that they that they are in a cult or never admit to it because oh it's always the enemy being in a cult and, yeah. and we're not. But have they ever gone through that list of of uh, the definition of a cult yeah. or how much control? So the more control there is, the more micromanagement there is, the more you can speak of a cult or yeah. cultic behavior. Uh, but there is there is a lot. Um, so yeah, this is one because that that's what you said just now about even your own thoughts. Mm. Um, that's what I wanted to say is that one of the most harmful effects of being controlled by a group or even by a relation is that they make you believe that your thoughts, your emotions, your feelings, your needs um, are absolutely not to be trusted. You are not to be trusted. And within in Jehovah's Witnesses, uh, in the organization of Jehovah's Witnesses, they tell you that you should not rely on your own. Uh, yeah, they, they refer to it as independent thinking, don't they? Yeah, and that's uh, uh, then you are selfish or mm. arrogant. Or, huh? But yep. they, they actually do is destabilize you to the core because you don't even allow yourself to trust your own gut yep. or to trust your own intuition or your own compass. Uh, you are, and if you are not to be trusted, how can you feel safe in the world? Yeah. And how can you feel safe within yourself? Because then you don't trust your own thinking. You immediately have a sort of a counter reaction to it and say, oh my God, I have to be almost afraid of myself. What's coming up in my mind? Oh, it can be influenced by Satan. Oops, this this is yeah. just my own bad, my own bad sinful uh, thoughts. Or uh, oh, I'm thinking a critical um, um, a critical thought about the organization. Oh, that means so you can immediately connect it to something bad or something yeah. that that God will even will no longer love you or so that it's connected to so many responses inside of your body that you don't even want to go there you just um and that's if they have reached that level of control so you internalized it completely as if you're convinced that this is absolutely true this is this is what it's like they don't even need to be there physically mm. Because you internalize it in a way that without, in the middle of the of the night, you will have your own responses, yeah. copy them. Well, I mean, the um, just, just some of the methods that are used to generate this level of control. Like when you go to a, a meeting, for example, you're expected to have received the publication and read it when you received it. You, you're expected to have read it before you go to the meeting and to prepare answers to give. When you're at the meeting, they read it from the platform. Then you put your hand up and you actually repeat it again in your own words. And it's like you're hearing it said to you. You're speaking it. It's going back in your ears, reinforcing it again. Uh, and if you ever look even at things like the songs that are sung, like music is very emotional. If you look at the lyrics of the songs, 
they're loaded as well. So I've, oh, I've, I think you're, you, you, you've basically seen all the things that I saw and many other people have seen along the line. There's the, the, the feelings of guilt. There's the feelings of fear. Uh, there's the hypocrisy, the double speak that's always going on. There's the loss of identity Total yeah. loss of identity. You you said that you you know you started to feel like uh, the JW version of you was like a little child, um, and there's also this oh, complete oh, control. Be... Yeah, yeah. Because it's not the JW version that felt like a child. I felt like a child. The JW version felt strong. Oh, I, s- I see what you're saying. Yeah, yeah, when you tried to go out into the world. That's when yeah. you felt like a child. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. I, I understand. Um, and this level of control, the B-I-T-E, you know, it comes right down to your very core. Um, I'd like to move into that next because we're going to get into one of the key ways that they control people, and that is this fear of uh, mm. being shunned and the guilt mm. that comes with being shunned. Uh, before we jump into that, can I just um, ask you – did you start down the mental health uh, profession before you left the witnesses or did you leave the witnesses and find yourself being shunned and then decide to move into mental health? Yeah. Um, after leaving. After because leaving. Because I was 49, 50 when I started, I went, when I went back to school. So I went to the Academy of mm. Coaching and Counselling because I – uh, we were already since 2005 active on Fora. So the last meeting uh, we attended was in 2004. Mm-hmm. Uh, yeah. Mother died. She she lived with us for close to six years before she died. But um, after leaving, um, and we started that forum. Uh, I did all kinds of research and, and shared it on, on a public, FNIA, partly public and partly closed forum. Um, did people, we, uh, did witnesses find that and then uh, take offence at that? Yeah. Yeah. And not, not only that, that's, that's, that's one of the reasons we got this fellowship, because yeah. my husband had a, a blog and, uh, yeah. and he, he didn't want to shut it down. Um, but the fora was partly closed, so that was for former Joe's witness. So, yep. what she would do, how to move on, and, um, and not only being stuck in in in, uh, in in being angry at the organization or the people in it, that was not our intention mm-hmm. because that was yep. so it, too negative for us. Yep. We said no. We were born and raised in it. We also had good times. But we are just uh, we are against the the control and the yeah. uh, cultic aspects of it, um, and one of them, of course, was shunning. That was absolutely uh, mm-hmm. very very damaging. Um, but I wanted just to start a new life and, and start working. But um, on that forum, I shared a lot of information about the things that I learned. And they started to look at me as the one who knows. And I don't. I just, just like you, just trying to figure out life. Yeah. <laughs> trying to understand what's going on and, 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 and try to, to really get a grip on, on not only myself, but also hey, the, the world around me. So I was just wanting to understand why do people what they do? Why, why do they, these lovely people are being so controlled mm. that they even are willing to shun their own family, yep. their own daughter, their own son, their own grandmother, their own... How? How is that possible? So I just didn't get it. And yep. I wanted to understand. So all the study they were starting to do, just because I wanted to, um, this just caused a lot of interest of people... Uh, on the forum and said, well, sure, well I, w- I would like to understand this and starting conversations. But I thought, well, I'm missing counselling skills. Mm. Go back to school. Get Go back to school. Skills. Yeah. So did the, um, it, it sounds to me, correct me if I'm wrong here, but it sounds to me uh, you you are coming from a similar ang- angle as I did. I know you've gone down the professional counselling um, 
therapy route. I actually went down a slightly different route. It's not the same thing. I, I uh, studied life coaching for three years. Um, similar reasons, uh, I think. I was very interested in knowing how people tick. And yeah. most of all, I was really interested in knowing how I tick. Why do, <laughs> why do I think the things I think? Yeah, they um, start. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And as soon as you start dipping into that that kind of pool where you start learning how the mind works and the brain works and how it can be uh, manipulated by outside forces, yeah. it's quite a it's quite a scary thing actually. You suddenly realise, oh. hang on a minute, um, I'm actually being controlled here. Yeah. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, the, the positive side of it is, is you start to see how it's possible to undo the control. You have to understand it first mm, before you exactly can break that control. And, yeah. and uh, under, understanding yourself is the start because you cannot just read about this and say, oh, that applies to you and to yeah. you and to you and to you. Yeah. It's, uh, you're the guinea pig. Mm. So you have um apply it uh i had to apply it to myself first it's quite br it's it? quite um it's quite brutal as well the um the process of becoming a counselor or a therapist or a coach um you are a part of the coursework is to look at yourself and you have to be quite self-reflective even quite oh, yeah. critical of yourself before yes. you ever start yeah. to practice on anybody else oh yes yeah yeah oh. It is. You, you need to go through the whole thing. That's and, painful. And, <laughs> yeah, dealing yeah. with panic attacks, how to yeah, yeah. respond, to getting you to understand your mind, and going through things instead of avoiding them. Yeah, and that. So it's not. I cannot ask anybody to open up their hearts if I'm not. If willing you've not to done do it, so. yeah. Did you do yeah. um, when you were studying to become a th uh, th therapist? Have, have I got that correct? You're a therapist. Is that is that the word you use? Yeah. Therapist, because yeah. uh, there is I, I always, counselor. Keep it simple. Counselor yeah. therapist, yeah, because that is different than life coaching. Mm -hmm. Therapy. I I've always thought of it that therapy and counselling is particularly good at the point where a, a person is really struggling, um, mm -hmm. and and they're kind of broken and they're trying to find find their way out of the mess. Uh, life coaching, I think, tends to come after that. It's when the person's in a much better frame of mind yeah. mentally um and they're able to then think you know i feel really good and now i want to accomplish something new uh, there's a bit yeah. of an overlap between the two but that's yeah would you agree with that yeah. yeah um they absolutely need. so uh and, and one of the things that you have to do as well i would imagine is uh, did you have to ask for feedback from other people about yourself yeah yeah, that that's quite oh, yeah. that's quite brutal as well, isn't it? Yeah, what do you think of me? <laughs> and be honest. Yeah. yeah okay. <laughs> so um, you've identified the guilt, the control, the the feelings of fear, um, the hypocrisy. You're starting to see. You've got children. You don't want this to to kind of rub off on them. You now find yourself in this situation where uh, you're dis you get disfellowshipped. I assume because of the asking Especially the questions yeah to be open about so yep. when uh, not uh, not many came to our house to mm. really listen to what we say. did you, did you get branded with the uh, the big a the uh, apostate label yeah. yeah yeah especially after we we just opened our mouths so if if somebody would come to to our house and ask us why why don't you come to meetings anymore then we explained why because yeah. they they were willing to to hear it, not because we wanted them to to leave the organisation, but that's just yeah, you're just being that's honest. What I felt. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Honest. And and a few then afterwards also left the organisation. So then it was for the organisation we became dangerous. Yeah, I, I, I'm I'm the same. Uh, quite a <laughs> few quite a few of my uh, friends have left. Um, yeah. So. I mean, that's just another area where the control comes in. If you're disfellowshipped, if you're shunned, um, you know, if you're given the big label of apostate, which is kind of the worst possible thing that you can be. Um, mm. I mean, they even 
hate apostates, I think, more than they do child abusers. That that seems to be yeah. how, how things are. There's yeah. a lot of guilt there. Um, now, I want to move into this sort of area of the shunning bec- and, and this kind of demonising people because that, that's effectively what it is. This is a kind of weapon that's used, uh, again, to control people. They say... Um, that shunning is a personal decision, um, like refusing a blood transfusion. I would argue that in both cases it's not. No. For the simple reason that if you don't shun a person that you're told to shun, you run the risk of being shunned yourself. You're you're viewed as being seen, seen as the- sharing in yeah. the sins of another another person, particularly if they if they are um an apostate if they're branded as an apostate just a clarification on that the word apostate it literally just means somebody that renounces a former belief that's that's all it means it's that you believed something and now you don't that's all it means so if you were a catholic and you became a jehovah's witness you're an apostate from the catholic church yeah yeah there's nothing inherently evil about being an apostate. It just no. means you changed your mind. Yes. But the problem is you're not allowed to change your mind once you're a Jehovah's Witness. That's the thing. They say you are. They say you are. Anyone can leave. Anyone can change their mind. But if they do, it comes with all this uh, baggage of the, you know, you're now a bad associate. We're not allowed to talk to you. We've we've got to shun yeah. you, that sort of thing. Um. We are particularly talking about mandated shunning. Um, Hopefully you would agree with this. There is a difference. Um, If I want to not speak to somebody, that's my prerogative. If I I don't like the person, if I think they're negative, bad influence, I don't speak to them. That's my decision. Um, But when it's religious shunning, it's basically somebody else is telling you, whether it's the governing body of Jehovah's Witnesses or, you know, a cult leader, they're telling you that you're not allowed to speak to somebody else. Yeah. So it's not so much the fact that you're not speaking to someone. You know, that is a personal decision. It's the fact that with mandated shunning, it's no longer personal. You're being forced to cut off your family and so forth. They, they, yeah, they they prepare it very carefully because they, they don't do. want to be held responsible for what they are saying. So they act as if they're completely innocent to say, "Oh, it's not my fault." Yeah? But yeah, yeah. what they are saying and then explaining is they are constantly framing, they are labeling the people who Correct. are out. Yeah. Uh, that, so that's part of the problem. So that's what be it, it's being taught. Uh, it's being taught that if you are a apostate, then you are, and then you are being described as a person that is really so evil and so scary, they don't even dare to, to talk with you because, oh, my God, they might get discouraged. Mm. Yeah, and those, discouraged. You, you might you might change your mind about it being the truth. Um, now, yeah. we, we work very closely um, with an organization called Stop Mandated Shunning. Um, people may know that as uh, shunning is a crime. Uh, it's just been rebranded. The name has just been changed over to stop mandated shunning, uh, which is more of a call to action. Um, one of the areas that uh, stop mandated shunning has been involved in is the court case in Norway. And that that's a really good example where the court actually found when they looked at the Watchtower publications, that the Watchtower does actually force people to shun. It is mandated. It's not a personal decision. That's been proved in a court of law. That's taken a long time to establish that. Um, yeah. They would say, oh, no, you know, we're, we're, being, we're being persecuted. It's, it's, it's not correct. But if you if you take the time to bother to read the transcripts of the court cases, to look at all the evidence that was provided, the stories that was presented. That was a very fair trial. Um, Stop Mandated Shunning is part of the Open Minds Foundation, which campaigns against um, coercive control over over people. 
It's not just Jehovah's Witnesses. It's ultra-Orthodox Jews, um, exclusive brethren, Amish, uh, the Baha'i faith, and Scientology. They all practice some level of uh, either shunning or blacklisting or uh, disconnection or whatever you want to call it. Again, it's mandated across the board with these. Um, mandated shunning, I would say, is completely different to just removing your membership from an organisation due to some kind of infraction of the rules. So, for example, if you if you decide that you don't want to do what a Jehovah's Witness does, the organisation has every right to say, well, you can't be a Jehovah's Witness anymore. I, I, yeah. I think that would, that would be fair to say. Um, no one will <laughs> yeah, it's yeah. it's what happens after a person is um, removed from the organisation. Are they just treated like someone who's just not a member anymore? Um, no, you know, if you go from if you go from being a Jehovah's Witness to being disfellowshipped, or if or even if you disassociate, you know, even if you you don't get kicked out for committing a sin, you just decide you don't want to be one anymore. Yeah. They will, they will completely shun you. Um, yeah. They'll get One you way yeah. completely. Um, and just something that, because we're going to move into a little bit with the mental health issues in a moment with this. One of the other things that I've noted that happens as well, you can have someone who, for example, is a victim of child sexual abuse within the organisation. This happens a lot. The person is so broken by the fact that a fellow Jehovah's Witness abused them that they decide they cannot be a Jehovah's Witness anymore. So they disassociate. They don't want anything to do with the religion because it hurt them so much. They've not committed any crime. They've not committed any sin that the perpetrator has done this. Not them. They're the victim. Mm -hmm. But because they've disassociated, they too are shunned. Yeah. What what's your thoughts on that? How how bad does that affect mental health? Would you say for for somebody in that position? It, it, They're already at a really broken state, aren't they? Yeah, it's 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 so harmful because the person really needs their own family. They right. need their friends to support them in order to feel not completely lost or cut off from uh, from support so they need their support system and if they are cut off the support system because they are being seen as bad yeah. because hey, they are the ones that are at fault because they leave the organization they should stay in oh i do forgive the person because he's so sorry huh? but hey, they, they keep on having that person in the meetings well, they, well, this this is the thing that the the perpetrator often uh, often experiences better treatment than the victim. Exactly, and yeah. then the victim needs to see how that person is being accepted, in spite of what he did, mm. and they are not allowed to talk about it because that's being seen as slander. Yeah, They're not allowed Divisive. to talk about it. Yeah, yeah. They also cut off their possibility to process the whole system, the whole the whole abuse that was taking place. And the one of the worst things they can do, so they're actually causing secondary <clears throat> victimization. Secondary uh, victimization. And, yeah. Mm -hmm. And what they um, what they actually emphasize, and that's one of the most, I think, psychologically very very dangerous. They make the person think that it's something wrong with them for right. yeah. responding the way they do. So I can't stand being in the room with my own, with, with the abuser, and then we are to blame? Really? Mm. So we, we can't cope with that. I'll just pray a little bit more to Jehovah and you'll be okay. That doesn't cut it. Yep. So the person is, um, and that's, that's really, really harmful, yep. the person is being seen not only by family members or the people they trust and love and should be their support system, being seen as a person that has something wrong with. And they just deny the effect of trauma. They deny trauma. They have this, this uh, idea, the responses that you show are not normal. Yes, they are. But they, don't, they do not 
recognize or accept the fact that also the organization is part of the trauma. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, you feel guilty when you're in, you feel guilty when you're kicked out. Absolutely. Yeah, and, yeah. And yeah. Also, who did the abusing is still part of often still part of the organization right and you are seen as the cause of problems because you <clears throat> get angry or you don't tolerate the person in your in your surroundings well oh. that's that's completely normal but they so they it it causes a lot of psychological or a lot of emotional trauma yet again above the trauma that's yeah, well, already there. Well, let, let's let's talk about that. So you've used the word trauma a few times uh, in your experience as a mental health professional. Obviously, I don't want you to you can't break confidentiality. So I don't I don't want to make you feel uncomfortable. You know, speaking about specific cases, but um, you you must come across people that have experienced trauma from lots of different avenues. Not not necessarily religious trauma. Other things cause yeah. trauma. You know, people can die. You can have a bad accident. Um, whatever, all sorts of things. How does um, the trauma that a person who is being shunned? How does that compare with other types of trauma? So you know, abuse, domestic abuse, violence, death, illness you know, loss, that kind of thing. Someone that comes to you seeking help and their problem is they're being shunned. Does that manifest as, I don't know, trauma, PTSD? Oh, yeah, 100%. Mm -hmm. It's the, the, um, the response that they feel, they, it's, it's often turned <coughs> against themselves. So they often... Uh, come together with suicidal thoughts oh. with uh, right, yeah. ideas of I'm not worthy or I did something wrong or not being heard uh, not allowed to be in contact with the people not talk about it not talking it through so they can process it so they don't know where to go and often the, the first talks that we have often is about that, is about feeling there's no way out, there is, I don't, I don't even want to be here anymore because all those people who, who say they love me punish me for having all these responses in me and, yeah. I, and not being allowed to be critical about the way they were treated or the way that, because it's, it's a no-go to be critical about the organization and the way they responded because it's always just a bit minimized by ah, just um just forgive and forget and so you you do and see just, yeah. um you, you you must see a lot of depression i mean when i when i was a jehovah's witness i had depression terrible depression which seems to have mysteriously uh, disappeared ever since i've not been a jehovah's witness that's interesting isn't it um ptsd yeah. you must see that um is there you, you mentioned about suicide um when someone is shunned what how high would you place the risk of suicide when someone is shunned is that is that just it's very dangerous to say <laughs> yeah but uh... It's um, it, it's a very delicate subject. Um, I think it's a way that people feel it's um, a way to <coughs> fight. Oh, I've 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 read a lot about trauma. Went to all kind of uh, being educated about uh, suicidal thoughts, the effect of it, the reason for it, and a lot of people who have them don't want to die. They just right. don't want yeah, yeah, to die. Yeah. Yep. die. It's about uh, having these feelings that they cannot deal with stop. Yeah. It has to stop because it, it's they just, not about... just want the uh, pain to stop, yeah. Yeah, and mm. not, not knowing any other way out of it because... And that's where the shunning steps in, especially when it's mandated shunning, that they feel it is organized 
in order to make them do anything different that they are capable of. So I can't go back to the organization, for instance, because of what happened and because I don't no longer agree or mm. because I've mm-hmm. seen a lot of things that <clears throat> I cannot, I do not agree with. So I have my own opinion about the organization. I'm being punished for that. And uh, not only that, but also I see all of these people that actually are doing things or supporting the abuser or supporting the system that is also very abusive. And I'm the one who has to deal with with uh, the effect of it. So the damage. Yeah. So it all back on the person who is actually a victim of being treated that way, being mm. abused and not not only sexually there is, there are all kinds of abuse yeah there is spiritual abuse there is emotional abu- abuse uh, psychological abuse yeah and sometimes even depends on the family also physical abuse yeah because they want to step in line yeah and and often after when when a child is not sitting quietly and sitting still they they will be punished yeah, for, for that. Well, you, you know, I mean, you, you, some of some of those things there. Um, I mean, I, I look back and cringe now because I was raised. Uh, I'm third. I well, I was third generation uh, Jehovah's Witness. My dad was raised as a Jehovah's Witness. When he was a little baby, he would be smacked if he cried at a meeting. So when I was growing up as a little boy. If I cried at a meeting or spoke at a meeting, I was taken out and smacked. Yeah. Um, And I'm ashamed to say, I mean, I realized fairly quickly on uh, in the process that it wasn't a good thing. But when I first had children of my own, I carried that over. It was expected of of me. It's all I knew. Um, your children have to sit still at a meeting and listen. And if they don't, you take them out and smack them. Um, yeah. So you're right. You know, there's there's that sort of abuse. There's um, domestic abuse happens behind closed doors in these religious families. Sexual abuse we've already touched on. And then, of course, you're then loaded up with all the, the spiritual abuse that, that comes with it. So there's no wonder that people go into therapy feeling pretty bad. Um Without breaking any kind of confidentialities, what would you say is the most severe situation or situations? If you, I mean, you can conflate them if you like, that you've had to deal with as a as a therapist. What's the kind of, you know, the worst case scenario that you would have to deal with? It, it, it it's really hard to um, to. Well, because I thought about your question when you mm. when you send it to me, it's really hard to make that kind of 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 a distinction because because uh, it it's all about also about the person themselves how oh, much right. they yeah, can yeah. they can deal with. For some, it uh, half of it is already too much, and they feel completely devastated and and right. yeah. Like, to not being able to move anymore and 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 wanting to end it all and for okay. others it can it can be twice as much and they can deal with it so a lot has to do with how much can you carry how much um, uh, your that's, resilience that's uh, that's a very you, that's a very good response actually yes that that makes perfect sense yeah. I mean um, you know I, the I can give an yeah, get an example um, if you, if you can without uh, using any names. Yeah, I know yeah. That, um, is open on. Uh, we'll talk about his own situation online. So um, uh, I will not uh, name uh, names, of course, but the person <clears throat> is is open about mm. the situation. Yeah. Um, but if a person who has been in the organization for a very long time. And he left when he was in his 70s because he couldn't deal anymore with not only the pressure or, or mm-hmm. but also the domestic violence that's happening in his own home against him. Yeah. So it is a um, leaving then the organization because you it, you, <clears throat> you can't you cannot take anymore. That person is now 80. 
he has five children. He has about now he, he could have about hey he had twelve when I got to know him and and later on he had a few more that he never saw grandchildren. Never, so mm. all kinds of um, um, marriages and all the things that happen within the family he could not be a part of yeah, because his he had a, a, a sort of a you, you can take just. So more is that much and not anymore. So if you then also being punished for that, that you are not being able to take more than you can carry and then have to leave also out of self-preservation and then being punished for that fact that you think critically, open your mouth, just go through the process of trying to get back on your feet and um, I know that afterwards one of his children got out, but many stayed in and treat him as the enemy. Yeah. And all the effects of trauma, uh, maybe people can't just respond irrationally or be angry at some point and then, then shout or have a, um, a response that people say, well, oh, that's not right, that's, that's not uh, civil or social. That can be, but think about where it's coming from. Yep. Think about how much that person had to endure. And there is no room for any um, mistake or, or uh, failure, um, but for the organization that has treated that person so, so badly yep. and with so much harm, they get away with it. And it's a sort of an organized group that all together support one another in their behavior. And, and that's one of the things that is so harmful, that they support each other in the abuse. They, um, they sh how do you call it, that they show. Huh? So mm -hmm. they are abusing people as a group, being convinced that this is the truth. And they are being taught every week a couple of times how good it is that they are actually um, um, abusing other people. They are, they are yeah. abusing other people. Yeah. How good for you, but this is the way to get them back. Yeah. And I know that you have seen this because I, I think I've heard you say that. Why disfellowshipping is a loving oh, provision. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, that's a well. Just um, j just on this, uh, you know, the way that the organisation reacts to these things. I'm thinking particularly now of Jehovah's Witnesses, the uh, Watchtower Society. Um, this this was recently taken to the Norway court, um, and it was the, the the idea was put forward that it was an abuse of human rights. Okay, mandated yeah. shunning was an abuse of human rights. Um, that was upheld. It's found to actually be an abuse of human rights. And I believe, uh, strongly believe that as a knee jerk reaction to that, that verdict, uh, Watchtower has gone away and made some recent changes. Now, the recent changes are that when someone is disfellowshipped or disassociated, their friends and their family can now contact them um, to invite them specifically for this reason, to invite them along to the Kingdom Hall to a meeting, to a, to a yeah. church meeting. Um, if they go, so the person goes along to the Kingdom Hall, when they enter the Kingdom Hall, people are allowed now to say a brief greeting. So you're allowed to say something like, hello, it's nice to see you. Uh, you're not allowed to... Uh, an extensive talk with the person. It is literally just, hi, nice to see you at the Kingdom Hall. No hugs, nothing like that. Um, but then outside of the meeting environment, you know, if you bumped into them in the supermarket or whatever, unless you're inviting them to another meeting, um, again, you revert back to that, oh, not allowed to talk to you because you're being shunned. And if you're deemed to be an apostate, so this is somebody who no longer believes it's the truth, uh, and dare I say, even has the courage to speak out about it. They don't even get the invite to the meeting. 
Not that I think most of us would even want one, but that's not the point. I didn't, yeah. um, I didn't get it. <laughs> did you? Did you get an invite? No, no, I, I, know, I never got one either. Um, <laughs> what do you think to that? Because that is being spun at the moment as evidence of God's mercy that you're allowed to ring your disfellowship person up as long as they're not an apostate, invite them to the meeting, and if they come to the meeting, you're allowed to say hello, but no more. It what effect me, is that having on people psychologically? It makes me extremely sad because mm. people inside are made to believe that they're good, doing a good thing, so they feel relieved of their guilt right. of <laughs> doing something wrong. Yeah, yeah. But the effect on it, it's again the person that now gets the responsibility to either you accept this kindness, eh, this so-called kindness, mm -hmm. um, and if you don't, well, then it's up to you. It's 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 out of our hands. We are being kind. We are inviting you. You can have contact, but only in for them safe environment that they get that are safe and being controlled in the congregation because in the congregation they cannot have this personal conversation that you want to have with your father your mother your 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 uh, children or or your dear friends you can't do that because you are constantly being controlled by people in the, that you do exactly what's being told. And that's just great. No hugs. Just eh, show kindness with that kingdom yeah, 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 smile. Yeah, the kingdom smile, yeah. Yeah, so, I mean, I, I, I obviously I worry sure. about the uh, psychological, psychological effects this is having on the people being shunned. But I think this is also having a serious psychological effect on the ones doing the shunning. W would you agree with that yes. as a mental health professional? They are also victims mm -hmm. of, especially those who are born and raised in it, who have seen nothing else than that, that way of behaving or that uh, they are framing, grooming and gaslighting big time. So that's part of the, the whole control. So if it's being framed as love, they do not dare to explain it differently because then you do not agree with the leaders of the organization. And that's the biggest sin, almost the biggest sin. You Absolutely. can even say, I no longer believe in God. I no longer believe in Jehovah and you'll be forgiven mm. and you will have talk and they say hey let's talk about this everybody will have it once in a while their doubts about god eh? and you're going through a process no problem but dare say mm -hmm. that you are no longer believing in the authority of what they call the faithful and discreet slave the leaders of the organization you're out that's it yeah that that was exactly that was exactly my experience uh, as well so um how would you start in helping somebody that comes to you that's that's been shunned or, you know, they've either been disfellowshipped or they've disassociated or if it's another religion, maybe they've been disconnected, whatever the terminology, terminology is. They come to you and they've lost everything. They've lost all their friends and family. They're experiencing depression, trauma, PTSD. Where do you start um, in your therapy practice that's, it's really that that is not easy to answer because um it's um, i totally believe in that we all people are individuals so when uh, a person mm -hmm. steps into my the first thing i need to know i need to understand is what's the current situation what's the current uh, also emotional, psychological, um, what's his story? What's, um, to listen to that first, what's their state of mind in this moment? Yeah. Are they, hey, you, you probably know that out of life, life coaching, are they 
Uh, is it possible to have a conversation? Are they in the window of tolerance? Oh, well, ex exactly, yes, because if I have somebody that comes as a, as a life coach comes to me and they're at the brink of suicide, um, I don't coach them. I send them back to the... Uh, exactly. I'll probably send them, back to, send them back to you. <laughs> yeah. have, yeah. There has to happen something first before... Correct, so I, yeah. I first coach people and it coaching will, in time become counselling because first right. you, okay. they need a more straightforward support in what to do mm. and how to see it. So I think psychological education about the psychological effects of of our brain uh, so they can um, uh, give words to what they experience because first they are very um, in that this uh, very um, well, in a very confused state. So to deconfuse them, they need um, words for what they are feeling. They need uh, a, a person who can explain to them what happens to them. Mm. And so to give words to that is extremely important. So they'll get a grip on their own process, <clears throat> and they because they need to be as soon as possible in charge of their own process and feel that they get the information, they can make informed decisions uh, about their yeah. lives, about what's going on inside them. Yeah, I, th I think that's really important. I mean, my, my situation when I was disfellowshipped, um, I was in terribly confused state. I was suicidal. Um, I did actually attempt suicide several, several times. I'm still here to, you know, tell the story. Um, but I went, I went into therapy. I had specifically, I, I had, uh, abuse therapy and this, this kind of related to my past, my childhood, um, past relationship and, and also from being a Jehovah's witness, um, one of the things that really helped me when I was in this car, you, you said about this feeling of wanting to go back, but realizing that you can't go back because you don't believe it anymore. That that's mm -hmm. kind of where I was. And the therapist used the term oscillation. She said, it's like you're kind of in this middle ground. Sometimes you feel a pull to go back, but then you realize you can't. So you sort of snap back to this middle bit so then you consider moving forward and making a new life in the so-called world, but then that's too scary. So you snip, snap back to this middle bit. And it's this, this kind of feeling of oscillation in those early stages. Um, it's very disorienting. And I think the advice, the, the advice I, I would give anyone, I don't know if you would agree with this, is kind of, don't just sit with it for a period of time. Don't make any rash decisions. No. Uh, don't no. go back because that obviously didn't work anyway the first time. Don't go back. Uh, and also don't jump into anything new to start with. No. You know, people are thinking, no. oh, I've lost my religion. I need a new religion. I need a new church. I, I need to do this, do that. I actually just spent a lot of time resting and sleeping. Yeah. Yeah. Just the basics. Yeah. yeah. Just you you need the basics and just to 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 learn to and that's that's also one of the things that they really need support with in how to take charge of their own life so because we have, if you have learned so many years that you are not the one that is allowed to take charge because Correct, you have yeah. no authority in your life because your thoughts are not to be trusted uh, watch out satan is just around the corner the world is not to be trusted people in it uh, I, I, I i felt like you when when i when i was uh, first out i literally felt like a little child that had been dropped into a big city yeah with no yeah. coping skills skills what yeah. so Ever. Um, Maslow's hierarchy of needs is a very good uh, place to go, isn't it? It's the triangle where it starts with, you know, to start with, don't be thinking about whether to go back or whether to join a new religion or what your beliefs in God are. Um, no. Start with food. Yeah. Drink. The basics. Sleep. Yeah. 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 
um, yeah. some source of, source of money. I mean, if you've lost everything like I did, you may have to go and ask for help, you know, from the government or whatever. If if you're so seriously mentally damaged at that point that you can't even work, mm -hmm. um, get those basic things in place. And then you kind of move on from the physical to then you move into this sort of mental area where you start yeah. thinking about thinking. You need support in how to do this because, as as we both have experienced and, and a lot of people have, is they get, if you fall back in, if you regress, so you've, you, you fall back in that child mode, what's absolutely encouraged in the organization. Absolutely, yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I'll be submitted uh, because if you do, you're you're almost just you you can just comply whenever they want you to. Huh? But if a if you are out and still do not believe that you are the one that's capable of doing that, it's Correct. getting yeah. that trust in you again. That uh, so that that's one of the the very very important things that has to go alongside that finding the basics that what you know to be true and what you felt was, um, for instance, the criticism was just. Absolutely, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That other people, the way they treated you was wrong. Mm. So to help you understand that you did a lot of good things for yeah. yourself yeah. in self-preservation. So the things that you need to do is hearing from somebody else the good aspects of you, okay? yeah. so that you you being supported in in the good things that you you have done, and also that what's what's your responsibility and what's the responsibility of the other person? There has to be a distinction because we have learned to take on responsibility for the universe, for God, <laughs> Satan, for mm -hmm. blood guilt. Do not preach. So that is such a the the the, the our, balance of responsibility is completely gone. Our, so you have to yeah. Our, our thought process was completely skewed, wasn't it? Oh. Completely. Yeah. So so basically, you find yourself you find yourself at that lowest point. Get the get the bare essentials in place to start with. Make sure you got a roof over your head, some food, drink, yeah. and then just rest. That's that's my advice. Just rest. Give yourself a little bit of a break. Don't make any rash decisions. Don't go back. Don't get worried about going forward at this stage. And then they need when you you need yeah. time and you need you and when you're ready to start moving on to the next stage, which is the mental mental health side of things, that process of deconstructing things that you've been told and actually figuring out what you actually think yourself. Quite often, yeah. that voice in the back of your head it wasn't lying. No. It, you no. know the answers are, are here exactly exactly Abs we, absolutely we well right but it was not acknowledged it was constantly framed as oh my god that's bad and oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And it's, it's the, the way they framed it that's part of the mandated yeah eh, um things that are going on that it's organized in such a way that you will not hear your own voice especially not when it's critical back yeah so yeah, the whole yeah. mirroring what we normally would need as a person being in a group and and and, and you hear uh, things back so these mirror neurons that we have in our brain uh, work perfectly fine when you are in the yeah. safe place but if you're not and you're being ostracized or being shunned because you are critical, then our brain gets completely uh, locked down. Yeah. So it's, yeah, we and that, that's and where fight. that's oh. where the help of the mental health expert like yourself is is needed at that yeah. point to try and sort of pick away. You know, it, yeah. This these voices that you hear, we all hear it. You know, it doesn't mean you're going crazy. The voices no. that you hear in your head, is it your voice or is it someone yes. else's? Is it an organization? Is it the governing body? Is it or is it yeah. is it your voice? That's yeah. That's the thing exactly. you need to identify. Um and how much do we internalize? Huh? Internalizing. Yeah. And then obviously once you've kind of, you know, you've made some progress with the, the mental health aspects, you're in a much better position then to move on to like the emotional side and possibly the spiritual side as well. Mm -hmm. Um, 
but not really until you you've got your thinking straight because if you don't if you don't get your th- the ability to think back for yourself you're just yeah. going to do it all over again you're going to run into bad emotional relationships bad spiritual relationships and so forth when it comes to the yeah. emotional side obviously um uh, you know, we've we've lost our families. I, I've lost my dad. I've lost my you know my sister, my kids, and so forth. All my friends. Um, I think there's a point where you you reach a point in your recovery where you realise unless they change, they're not. You're not going to get them back. You've lost those emotional yeah. connections. Um, is it possible? to recover from that kind of loss in your experience when you've lost everybody is it possible to still have healthy emotional relationships outside of your natural biological family yes yes but what you do need is at first becoming safely attached to yourself ah relationship with self first that's yeah, yeah. So to 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 get to understand um, that you are not the problem, mm-hmm. but where coming from that the people who are so either under control or uh, um, doing what they're doing out of their fears and their misunderstanding and their point of view has <laughs> nothing to do with you not being worthy or you being a bad person or. Mm-hmm. A, they, they want to throw it on you as because of the things that you did, that they have no other choice than treat you like that. But to to see, um, I forgot the doubt, um, to give words to what's going on exactly helps you to see that it's not, um, it's not because there's something wrong with you. Yeah, right, yeah. But that damages yeah. also... Uh, that you are also making yourself feeling guilty. Oh, I, I shouldn't have done this. Oh, this is a bad decision. Oh, it's my fault that they don't want to talk to me. That that's where they want yeah. you to go. So you'll yeah. go back. And and you can you can never move into a healthy relationship with other people. Um, no, no. You know, let let alone sort of like you know like a life partner or something like that. If you're still feeling that level of control and guilt and fear and so you've got to get past that point before you start forming these yeah and understanding yourself mm. why you you do what you do why you, and why you feel and acknowledge that and being acknowledged for it yeah. and that's why the help is 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 needed but often you will find one or two friends you don't need a lot in order Correct. to get yeah that yeah Yep. Uh, yep. of information or that confirmation that you need so you can <clears throat> talk, you can hear yourself, explain things, other explain it from their point of view. You have to go through that first, but if you have the luck to get in contact with a person who is uh, can show you unconditional love, that is absolutely helpful to heal yep. From from the damage being done, Very so, much so because it's original love that's being shown to you, yeah, and it's perfectly mandated shunning. It's it, they are being close to yeah to, to to call it a loving provision. It's 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 simply not, is it? <laughs> um, uh, um, the uh, yeah. the the sign that's over my head there, Onion Unlimited. Uh, Part of the reason why I, I called it Onion Unlimited, you know, when you've got an onion, uh, you can peel away the layers of an onion until you get to the the heart in the middle. I often um, say to people that are in recovery that it's not so much about adding things to yourself. Um, it's about disregarding the things that no longer serve you. It's about peeling back those things. And that that can include your your thinking the controlled thinking that you've had, you get rid of that people that yeah. don't love you. They don't love you. Yeah. It's, you know, they, they love yeah. the organization more than they love you. That needs to go. You need to let go of so much. And then what you're left yeah. with is this beautiful person that is, you know, most people, the inside is decent. 
most people. Yeah. Um, yeah. And then, you know, once, once you've sort of found yourself, yes, you can then move on to find, uh, you know, relationships with other people, friendships, your friends, be your new friends become your new family. And uh, if you're, if you're so inclined as well, you may even start sort of reconstructing what your spiritual beliefs are as well. Not yeah. every, not everybody does. Some people become completely atheist. Yeah. But to to prevent cult hopping or Correct. or some kind of a, a getting into another relationship that is controlling you, it's extremely important to get to know yourself, Absolutely. knowing who you are. And yeah. part of that is is um, yeah, getting rid, like you said, like that onion, getting rid of all of these this extra stuff that's actually not yours, but not yours. Some, somebody else. Do you do you think there's a do you think there's a a, a risk as well? Um, ex ex Jehovah's Witnesses, and I, I would imagine this works for ex Scientologists, ex Mormons, and so on. Um, the XJW community, as as it's often referred to as, um, how how can I put this? There are, I mean, you're an XJW. I'm an XJW. I'm being very very careful here. We work with many XJWs. Um, there appear to me to be XJWs and XJWs. Not all. Oh, yeah. Not all. <laughs> you know, I'm trying to be very careful here, but not all XJWs are to coin an old word good association um they're not good for you mentally if you're not careful you can actually find you mentioned about moving beyond jehovah's witnesses you can just find yourself stuck in this pool of um people talking about the governing body for the rest of their life yeah what's what in the truth, out of the truth, the act. In the it, truth, out the truth. What is that doing to you mentally if you go from being a JW to being defined as an XJW and all you ever do is look at JW stuff to pick fault at it? Mentally, yeah. what is that doing to you? It, from it, your stops, you, it stops you from growing. Stops it you from stops growing. you from growing. It, yeah, it yeah, stops yeah. you from growing beyond your adolescent years. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, and you just carry over all the uh, all the narrow-minded thinking into being. <laughs> yeah, if if I would stay in there, being angry that I was treated yeah, correct, the way yeah. I was treated, and kicking back yeah. backwards, I would just just lose all my energy to that instead of living my life. Right. That's and that that's kind of. I've, I've I've kind of got to that point, I think, in my recovery now where, you know, uh, being a Jehovah's Witness will always be part of my past. It it, it has affected the way that I am. Um, I mean, I'd love it if JW thoughts didn't come into my head. They still do. But on a day to day basis, I don't care anymore. I don't believe no. it. I'm not interested in it. I'm not interested in it. Um, I just want to live my life, yeah. be a good person, help other people. That's that's kind of where I am. Um, in terms of, let me sort of wrap this podcast up um, now, in terms of what do you think the general public needs to understand about this practice of mandated shunning? What kind of changes do you think need to be enacted? What can um, people actually do about this to, to stop this from happening in the first place? Now, I think that's that's a bit of magical thinking <laughs> to think it will stop because I don't think it will because as long as people live, they will do this um, because uh, it also has a lot to do with fear on the part of mm. the, in the in, because they are so afraid that anything, that all these critical ideas are coming out and so they they're protecting that group by shunning others yeah so they 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 isolate and they isolate they they want to isolate the people who leave but they're actually isolating themselves and closing closing the doors closing the ranks so they uh no critical thought is coming in so they shun 
not only to punish people outside or who leave, but they also shun to protect what's what's left. Yeah, I mean, I, yeah. I, I'd like I'd like to think. Obviously, like I'm I'm quite involved with uh, the Stop Mandated Shunning dot org uh, campaign. Uh, if 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 you're listening to this and you are being shunned, it doesn't matter whether you're a Jehovah ex Jehovah's Witness, ex Scientologist, ex Amish, whatever. Um, if you go to stopmandatedshunning.org, there's actually a survey on there that you can take. And you can also tell your story anonymously if you want to. But particularly the survey results, what's happening at the moment is um, the survey results have been put into, into a database that is being extensively reviewed by researchers from several uh, universities, I believe. And then that data is actually being used to um, drive some of these court cases where it's kind of putting some pressure on the Watchtower organisation to change their policies when it comes to shunning, uh, mandated mandated shunning. Um, yeah, but, but do you know... Is that, it, it, do you it, think it, we'll Jane, ever see a time when shunning stops altogether? Or d- No, I don't no. think... If, I don't I don't think so but I think it's very important to keep on informing people on mm. the effect of it and why yeah. it is so harmful uh, that it causes often regularly uh, people to to commit suicide yeah. because they don't know where to go because they don't get the help they they need in order to make sense out of it because they it bounces back on them. They think that they did something wrong. Well, actually, they did nothing wrong. They started to disagree with opinions. Yep. It was, but it has no, people have no right to stand in between parents and children or uh, uh, just direct family. They are not allowed to step in between. That's a universal human right that we have. Yeah. And can disagree with other people, can disagree with a group and being shunned for it, absolutely fine. Just do whatever you think is necessary, but do not interfere with my connection to my father, my mother, my children, yeah. my my their friends if I choose to do so. And that's, they that's, really, the, uh, that's really the idea behind the Stop Mandated Shunning uh, campaign, yeah. isn't it? It's like, you know, we're not interested in seeing Jehovah's Witnesses or any other religion destroyed, that's not what it's about. You know, that, that, that would be just as controlling. We don't want to change, you know, if we if we don't believe in their beliefs, we, we don't want to change their beliefs. They can believe whatever they want to believe. That's a human right. But when it's, when it's like your family, your own children and your dad and your sister and your mum, when they're being held as ransom because yeah. you no longer believe that it's the truth, anymore yeah that as you say is an abuse of human rights it is a crime um norway has recognized that um i think slowly we will start to see other countries and other governments recognize that and i think eventually the watchtower organization and other religions are going to have to make some policy changes just well if they want any money from the government for one thing they're going to have to make some policy yeah, changes it, this one is difficult daniel because because it's um thing is that it is factually not a crime because there is no law broken if there would be a law yes absolutely that that it would be it would be just to call it a crime i would wish it was so um on an ethical level or on uh, the level of that they are using undue influence, that they are using framing, grooming, gaslighting, and all of these abusive uh, um, methods to get what they want. Yeah. Yeah? It's like a lot of not, that's, it's narcissistic behavior, what they are showing. That's, but... A crime is something different. Well, it, 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 a, a crime, I mean, this is part of the reasoning behind changing it from, um, it was originally called shunning is a crime. Yeah. Um, shunning isn't a crime. Um, Not factual. 
Yeah, yeah, not factually. Right. That's right. Yeah. So <laughs> it's um, and and it's it. What is a crime in one country isn't necessarily a crime in another. It depends on the law, doesn't it? So exactly. um, we're coming from it a lot more a broader aspect now. They've changed it to uh, stop mandated shunning, and mm -hmm. where there is a human rights issue, because some countries don't recognise it as a human rights issue, let yeah. alone a crime. Um, fortunately, Norway was very enlightened and recognised it as a human rights issue. Um, yeah. I think the only thing we can do is keep chipping away at it. It is a huge thing to try and change. And, yeah. you know, take the survey on stopmandatedshunning.org, tell your story, keep it before the public, um, donate where you can to help with some of these legal cases. But I think ultimately the biggest thing you can do um, as an individual is to just try and get yourself mentally so you can move on from being... Yeah, and get informed, anymore. get informed what it is about. Yeah, is it really a biblical thing? Is that important for you? Yeah. If it's a, a, a Bible based or not? If so, well, even then, it has no basis no. to treat to be treated that way. So it's it's good to to just get get yourself in get yourself into therapy and uh, yeah. rebuild a new life. That, that's the yeah. that's the key, isn't it? Um, can yeah. I can I just finish this uh, podcast just by ask asking you? This is more of a personal question. Um, what's your life like now? Are you, are you, are you happier? Happy? Um, is your life fulfilling and reward? I'm sure you have challenges still, but yeah, absolutely. Because, uh, like you said, um, had a depression and then leaving the organization uh, many things it's now gone it's amazing <laughs> isn't it yeah, yeah. So many, um, uh, and not only is it gone you're now a mental health professional helping other people <laughs> psychosomatic yeah. uh, symptoms that i had like yeah. in, in, in um, migraines all kinds yeah. of illnesses that just no are no longer there i became much healthier yeah. i became uh happier yeah. and um do you feel at, do you feel at peace the, do you feel at peace oh absolutely that's mm -hmm. I, I learned to be peaceful after leaving mm -hmm. and i always thought it depended on my obedience to the organization and then it would be then i would feel fulfilled but it was never there i constantly yeah. felt anxious and deep inside and that anxiety was attached to um, not being in peace with myself not knowing exactly or not being in charge of my my own life but i had to learn how to how to be free at first i didn't know because in my mind i was not there yet so in my mind i had to be free also not only physically free out but also uh, well, uh, i i think you're a uh, i think you're an outstanding example there and you're a you're a beacon a beacon of hope i think in terms of um people can like see it, it is possible to move, move on from that and uh, yeah. Yeah. yeah is there any uh, is there any little message that you would like to leave um just finally for anybody that is currently being shunned or worried about leaving in case they get shunned. It's 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 being shunned. Yeah, strangely enough, also has an upside. Yeah. <laughs> yeah so it's uh, it also gives you the freedom to think your own head, to, to to build your your own life, and to to think your own thoughts and and get um, giving yourself allowance to to figure out what that freedom looks like for you but never lose hope because yeah. you don't you don't know how things will work out yeah at, at this moment it might be completely hopeless or feeling as it's hopeless but you don't know because there are so many people who started out feeling that way and then while they were figuring out life and 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 they there were people coming out we came out yep because we were in for yeah. such a long time 
Yeah, yeah. I, I, I was in for 50 years. When I left, I like I say, I tried to commit suicide several times. I thought there was no way forward. I kept trying to go back. In the end, I decided, no, I can't do this anymore. Um, yep. Got myself some rest, starting to move forward. I've got lots of friends now. Um, yep. I've got, I wouldn't, I've not hundreds of friends. I've just got like, you know, a handful <laughs> of friends, but they're lovely friends. Um, yep. I am happy. I feel at peace. For the first time in my life, I'm not scared anymore. I'm literally yeah. not scared of men anymore. I used yeah. to be fearful yeah. of men, all the, you know, displeasing yeah. people. Yeah. Um, I like to think, you know, I'm still a a decent person underneath it all. I hope I am. Uh, mm -hmm. And uh, I'm getting married in October. So <laughs> Congratulations. You know, it's, it's, it's all good. You know, when you think you're... You're at your lowest. That would be my message. Just just get a bit of rest. Don't go back. Don't go back. Get some rest. And then when you've got yourself some uh, energy, go into therapy, figure out how to think properly, and then go and rebuild yeah. some uh, friends and a bit of a life. Exactly. And be exactly. happy. Well, yeah. um, Francis, thank you so much for joining us. That's been a, a really you. good podcast. I'm sure that's going to benefit a lot of people. You. <laughs> so um, yeah. you've been uh, you've been listening to uh, Onion Unlimited the podcast. That was Frances Peters, uh, mental health expert. Please check out her website, Free Choice Recovery, at uh, www.freechoice-recovery.com. And uh, if you like this uh, podcast, please uh, like, follow, and subscribe to Onion Unlimited for more interviews like this. That's all from me. Uh, for this time, thanks for joining us. Bye for now.